Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BDSM show. Before we get started, if you can hear me, please type into the chat box uh, on the right-hand side saying yes, um, and uh, we'll kick off. But while you guys are doing that, I think I'll probably just kick off and say, uh, if you guys are wondering what the name is about, this show is about budgeting, diversification, savings, and all things money. Uh, So if you guys were expecting something else, I'm sorry. Uh, This show is part of our new and exciting B project, uh, which you guys will all be hearing about very soon. Uh, Probably a very starting point of this. But anyway, my name is Ivan. I'm your host today, as I will be every week. So get used to me. Uh, In case you didn't know, all advice today is general. Well, this is the first show. And my very first guest is someone who needs a little introduction. Peter, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Sweet. And by the way, for those that I've just offended um, and shamed, I apologize. So Peter Asho is the co-founder of a company called Wealthy. Uh, that's Wealthy with an I. And it's an innovative prop tech solution helping users put investing plans in for bricks and mortar. Uh, if you're wondering if you've, you know, where have I seen Peter before, then it's likely you would have seen him on one of the many places that he's on. ABC, BBC, Bluebeck, CNBC, LinkedIn, Where else? I've seen you on many other places. But anyway, uh, our relationship spans back to uh, Stern and Shork days. uh, And we were just at that point in time starting in this cruel big fintech world. That was about six years ago. And uh, about then, I believe you started uh, really getting a passion for property or or at least starting to talk a lot more about property. But why did you switch over to the dark side from equities? How did that happen? (laughs) Well, the story I told, so you're right. I used to work in a stock market. Morning, doing stock research, launching their SMA fund. Uh, went into the CFD and forex space for a little while. And when I sat down with my ex grandma, and she asked me what I do because all her friends used to call her and say, "I can see your grandson on TV," she couldn't understand. And you know, she never went to school. And and while while it's it's often. Um, you know, customary to dismiss it as, oh, grandma doesn't know. I sat back one day and I said, there's nothing to do in that, you know, grandma doesn't know what I do. My grandma's advice was always buy a real estate, buy a house. You know? <laughs> and so that's what I did when my wife and I got married. She also came from a culture that wasn't, you know, um, didn't understand stock investing. And uh, the compromise was let's just buy real estate. But if I understand it, and I fundamentally believed in it as an investment. So one thing led to another. Um, I saw, you know, excellent businesses like yours, really smart guys, innovating and trying to help stock market investors. Um, but yet, when the real estate space, you've got to deal with a real estate agent that probably has no sophistication in, in five days, and they're advising you on a million dollar purchase. Where when you go and invest a million dollars in stocks, um, you get you get much better tools. And so I said, I'm going to do something about it. And then that set off a, a journey. And here we are today. Huh, interesting. I remember uh, when, uh, when I was courting uh, my wife-to-be, I remember she was looking to buy an investment property. I suggested maybe that's not a good idea at that point in time. I happened to be right at that point in time. But uh, if, if you were in my shoes now, you know, and, and sort of how what would you say about property? Is it something that, that that's a good long term investment, or you know, do we do we need to be worried about what's coming in the future for the economy? I think what I say to people is invest in what you understand, um, because when the crisis hit, what I saw is a lot of people had invested in things that they didn't understand, and so if you don't understand real estate, don't invest in it. If you understand mm-hmm. stocks and you fundamentally understand businesses better, and that's where it is. Go and buy stocks if you want to, you know, invest in gold or commodities or whatever it is. Um, so I believe all investments um, relative to cash are the way to go. We're in an environment now where this, where not just monetary policy um, is at ridiculously low levels, but fiscal policy. If you have a look at, you know, fiscal balance sheets and the amount of cash that's being created and mm. thrown out there, the worst place to be is just sitting in cash and doing nothing. And so whether it's real estate or stocks or anything, has an I think you should be, you know, com- absolutely considering diversifying out of cash and into that. Yeah, right. And, you know, one thing you mentioned before is just this concept of, of advice. And uh, it's something that I found so interesting that, you know, like my parents uh, sold off an investment property not so long ago. Uh, their real estate, uh, one of the real estate agents that I met came in and gave like this brutal kind of like, 
like proper proper financial advice, you know, the, the market is going to do this at, so, at a certain point in time. Like, how, how does real estate agents get away with this? And how do apps like yours come in and, and help with that? Well, yeah, it's a good question. So real estate agents are good at listing your house and selling it. You know, traditionally, if you want to, if you want to sell block agents, but there are a lot of good agents out there that for that objective, selling my house, they network with the community. They're, they're, they're good at creating relationships. They'll find you a buyer. However, on the purchasing side in Australia, we don't have a culture where you go and seek um, advice from a professional or opinion from a professional to make that purchase. In the United States, about 90% of homes that are purchased um, and agents because the structure of their market is fundamentally different. When you go sell your place, you pay 6%. That's half within the listing agent and half to the buyer's agent. Yet in Australia, we, we you know, if you're selling your place, you're probably paying 1% or 2%. There isn't anything there for the listing agent to share with the buyer's agent. And so traditionally what's happened in Australia and in the UK, you have to go and, and pay a buyer's agent, which is a relatively new space. Mm. The issue with that is that you need to have funds to deposit to make that investment. So there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? And so we don't have this culture, and we have this culture in Australia where Jimbo Smith sold my next-door neighbor's house. I'll go to Jimbo Smith and say, hey, what do you think? Is that a good place to buy? And because there's that void, there's that in the market, that's where it's been filled. Um, so businesses like Core Logic, for example, do a great job in providing data, but they've moved more institutional. They've been a sort of a limited population. It's a lot easier to sell data to businesses than it is to sell to individuals. So there's this massive gap, and that's the gap that we're looking to fill. Where you know, if you have someone that wants to invest um, and they want to use tools and data to to match their preferences with what's available in the market. Where's the utility? I don't want to go and have to pay a buyer's agent 50 grand to go and do my search. I'm willing to, you know, use my own intuition and make my own decisions, but help me, help make it easier for me. Um, and so that's where we're trying to fill that gap at the moment. That seems like a really good thing, especially for, you know, how the Australians have, they love being in control, but also need advice. And it's kind of like, it's, it's very different, as you know, to the rest of the world where, you know, people are either kind of in one camp or the other. Here it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to have an advisor, I'm going to use an advisor, but I'd like to have control over my own destiny. How does, so, so interestingly enough, you, you know, you mentioned CoreLogic, you guys are stepping in clearly into that, into that, you know, that, that retail uh, facing space. Um, and then you're sort of helping people put together a plan around this, right? So, so yeah. they can actually, um, uh, come up with, with the right strategy around how to actually invest? Yeah, because from from my experience, my investment experience, even when it comes to stocks, most people jump into investing without an actual plan. And it sounds true. Mm-hmm. Most people have a plan, you know. I know how to buy stocks. I know how to trade options. I know all that. I'm being plan. Yet the most successful investors, the best investors that are worth billions and billions of dollars, focus on their plan first. And so if you're jumping and you don't have a GPS system, you won't get to your destination. If you're buying stocks or if you're making any investment, if you go and look at the ASX top 100 and you look at their AGMs and you have a look at their pitch decks, the best companies will in the first few slides articulate what their strategy is and what their plan is. A chairman will always stand up and talk about what their plan is and how they've mm-hmm. achieved it. And real estate investing, like all other business, if you're buying stocks, if you're investing in bonds, it's no different. You need a plan. But because real estate is unique in that people that they live in and then the place that they invest, they collude that together and they don't treat their investments with the same approach as they would any other investment. Financial planners also don't like talking about real estate. So um, financial planners do a great job around your insurances, around your superannuation and around your investment. Anything that has good trail. <laughs> yeah, uh, anything that they can skim off, but, you know, the, the, the environment's set up. And when it comes to real estate, it's not on I don't want to talk about it. And so that's where we start, the plan. And, and we're not doing something magical. We're doing something very I'm saying, Ivan, we want you to just step back before you jump onto real estate and domain and go through all these classifieds. We want you to just have a think about where you are, how much you can afford, what 
and take that and match it with what's available on the market. Yeah. And, you know, you, you're, so obviously you're very passionate about property and, uh, you know, I'm sure you still have some some equities. And I do remember talking to options with you, which was awesome because at Stone and Shock, no one knew what options were. Uh, and it was good to actually to speak to someone who understood what options were. But if you're someone starting out, uh, let's say that you're in an, an age group right now where you're making the decision between buying or potentially renting. Um, and, you know, the first part is obviously assuming that you're, you already have the, enough for a deposit. What would you be looking at right now and, and how would you go about making a decision between renting or buying? That's a really good question. Um, I'll share my personal experience and then uh, I believe um, you should walk and so I want to share my experience. And, and I actually um, traded CFD uh, when I was at university and I built up a, a, a nice deposit to go and buy real estate. So... Um, it was a great way for me to build what were modest savings on a modest point. So there's no right or wrong way, right? Do the way that works for you. Um, what I would say to a young person is that real estate is very emotional. Um, look at the people that have built wealth. So if you have a look at guys that are selling their multi-billion dollar businesses, you know, you look at guys like Atlassian, um, and, and the most successful stock market investors, what do they actually do with their money? A lot of them go and buy real estate. And, and there's a reason why they do that. Have a look at the, the top 10 um, billionaires in Australia and where they've made their money. Real estate as an asset class works, okay? Buying bad real estate isn't a good idea. Um, buying good quality real estate is a game. Buy the best thing that you can afford. And if you can't afford that today, either build a plan or focus on buying an alternative. And so what surprises me about, um, I remember when I left the stock market and I went into real estate, I in, in the stock space that, that avoided me, you know, that would cross the street um, if I was on the street because it was seen as something really, really stupid. But um, a lot of stock market guys, that, because they had this misconception that, oh, you know, the, stock, uh, the real, real estate market is overvalued, it's going to fall by 40%. Um, you know, it's just a really, really dumb space to be in. But, you know, if we actually have a look at all the voices that are against real estate, they're all probably also buying shitty little mining stocks that are market capped at like $20 million in Mozambique, <laughs> drilling holes, ICO, you know, that's coming out of rock roll. So have a look at the shit talking and investment, have a look at what, what their background is and what they're doing, and then have a look at the smart guys and what they're doing. And that's my golden rule to everything. Mm. I remember, um, uh, you know, there was a, there's a large listed company that actually does a fair bit of life insurance, but they also have a property portfolio. And they were always, you know, uh, they, they had a whole business around going to places like, you know, out next to Newcastle, but not quite in Newcastle, buying a whole big block of land and, in, and and working with infrastructure providers to go on and, and build it up and then ultimately create, you know, like gated communities and all this kind of stuff. Is that gone? It, or, or, you know, when you talk about high quality things, are we talking about, you know, buying stuff which everyone wants, like, you know, a house on a beach or, or a unit on the beach? Or is a high quality investment something completely different? High quality investment is something that can piggyback off good infrastructure, um, that you get a good quality there and pay your rent and you're gonna it's gonna be relatively easy. It's the same as a good quality business, right? Why is Woolies a good quality business? Um, and I don't know, IGA or, or Metcash not, you know, have it's it's usual or why it's SaaS businesses trading on multiples of a billion times and mining services businesses trading on three times because it's the quality of your earnings. Okay. Yeah. If you've got a SaaS business, the valuations are ridiculous because that income comes in every month. If you've got a mining services business, you lose a contract, you're screwed and you've got all this equipment there. So good quality investment, whether it's a stock or whether it's real estate, whatever it is, it's the quality and consistency of your earnings. If you're going into Newcastle and you're doing all that fancy stuff, great, you can make a lot of money, but what's the consistency? What I say is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
right? You can buy something in Sydney and know that you're going to get good tenants, consistency, close to the city, and it works. You're not going to shoot the lights out, but you're not going to wake up one day and see that investment down 50%. So that's interesting. So, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the profiles of, of different investors are going to be different. So if you're, let's say you don't own a house right now or you don't own, own property, where would you see um, that first in investment? Is it something smaller that is in a, in a good location close to the city? Is it something that's bigger a little bit further out? I'm guessing that's something that most people have. Uh... Most, people want, most people want the best of everything, right? So they, don't, they have a limited deposit. They're starting out. Um, they want an awesome home close to the city. That's going to, they don't want to buy an apartment because someone told them that land goes up in value and apartments are bad. They don't want to pay strata. They, don't things and then they can't find what they want and they're like, oh, it's too hard. Um, student property prices are ridiculous, right? And the market's just screwed. However, if you, if you strip down what do, I, what do I want, what can I afford, what's the best quality thing that I can afford? If I've got 50 grand, for example, I can only afford something that's probably up to 500 grand, right? If I've got a good job, I can put a tenant in there and it can So your deposit will dictate your affordability. And so what you have today, work off what, what your potential affordability is. And then have a look at what's the best quality thing I can afford for that price, not what you want or not what you wish. Get that in five or 10 years' time, right? But work with what you can afford today. So most people starting out, um, let, let's do about 50 grand in savings, right? If, if we bell curve and say that uh, median distribution, 95% of the way people start out, 50 or 100 grand. 50 or 100 grand, if you're going to buy something 500 a day, there's a, there's a lot of really awesome stuff you can buy. So where would you buy in Sydney? You're not going to get something in Paddington or, or in Surrey Hills for 500 grand. But if you have a look at what's happening in Western Sydney, for example, a whole new economy is being carved out. It's the third largest economy in Australia. The GDP is worth $100 billion per year. That's bigger than many nation economies. You've got a new airport coming in. You've got population growth. It's a really, really smart and savvy place to be invested in Bankstown or in these areas that aren't trendy today, but you're going to have great tenants. You've got universities. You've got an airport coming in. Um, you've got infrastructure, you've got roads, you can rent them out on a four and a half, five percent yield, and you're going to make the yeah. offer, right? So, going and buying you for 500 grand, you pick up a two better that's 30, 40 years old. That's, that's not something that is going to shoot the lights out, but you're going to make money on that. So, that's just one little example. Then in Melbourne, um, you have a look at what's happening in Melbourne. We're in lockdowns. People are so fatigued. The sentiment, you know, the sentiment's right here at the bottom. Everyone's giving up. It's I can I can talk to that. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, Brisbane are probably probably would would hold off at the moment because of supply. Um, Adelaide has an issue with population growth. The Wild West um, in WA is just very volatile. You don't have that consistency, but if you know, you, you, if you're in those markets watching this, there are good quality investments that you can make. So you don't have to try to shoot the lights out for your first investment. You can go with something that works, something that's a little bit boring, something that isn't glossy, but something that's not boring. It's funny because that's exactly the same thing that good traders say about their trading plans. You know, like the, the junior traders go in and go, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to just go in and trade. And, yeah. and uh, I, I know, like I, I do a lot of, you know, I, I sell to teach a lot of uh, trading plans ultimately. And, you know, it's like the, the, the typical feedback that I get, it, it's so boring. Like, it's like, uh, yeah, it's not a casino. Like, you're here to make money. <laughs> Don't put 100 bucks in a, in a sports bet account and, and play with that, right? Exactly. Go, go and do whatever. Go and put um, entertainment money that you're willing to lose and then investing money that you don't want to lose, that you want to grow. Exactly, exactly. And how, how would you structure that? That And I don't know, obviously, you know, yours would have changed over time as well. But, uh, you know, for someone who is potentially a little bit younger or a little bit older, how would their exposure to property change over time? Um, so if you're hitting retirement, do you, do you start thinking about phasing out of investments? And if you're younger, you know, do you effectively say, look, small share portfolio, go into equities as soon as you can afford it, you know, and then... 
Um, you mean the balance between, between asset classes or the actual? Yeah. yeah. And obviously, you know, I don't want to push you into personal advice no, or anything I, like that. I'm, <laughs> just, I'm not likely to give personal advice anyway. So none of this, this is just, you know, education and personal experience. Um, one, I've, I've learned a couple of things. So people accountant and a good mortgage broker and a good solicitor is is amazing because when shit hits the fan and you need to rely on them and they come through it just it, it's just um having a good stockbroker having a good advice when times are tough everyone's there to take your money when when it's all rosy right but when the shit hits the fan you want someone that's there so you've got to experiment you know, ask suggestions, recommendations. So build a nice little going to be with you along that journey. A good accountant is gold. Don't go, most people don't like their accountant. So if you'll ask 10 people, hey, what do you think? Do you like your accountant? You know, it does more tax, paying a couple of hundred bucks. But find a good accountant that can actually you know, be there for you to, to be a sounding board for different things. Um, buying in the right structure, one of the things um, I, I did in hindsight, which was pretty good, was set up a family trust. Um, so, you know, my businesses are all held by the family trust. And if I'd done that too late, retrospectively, fixing mm. that would have been a bit of a shitstorm. Um, and An expensive shitstorm. And, and, and usually um, a good broker, a good mortgage broker, for example, will tell you how to structure things when you're going out and buying property. Uh, problems um, and with stocks, stocks also, you know, with CGT and everything else, um, make sure they get CGT benefits. If you buy a stock at like a buck and it goes to like 150 mm. bucks and you bought it through a company, um, and you're going to pay my, you know, your corporate tax rate and stuff like that, mm. um, it would have been better in hindsight to have structured it through a trust or in super or stuff like that. So, mm. that structuring to answer your question is really about having a good group of people to work with. Where do you find these people? I've got a good, that's an awesome, awesome question. So I've got a really good test. If you want to find a good accountant, go on Google and put in accountant, right? And most accountants suck at websites. Like their websites <laughs> absolutely suck. But if you've got 100 Google reviews and he's bidding for keywords, he's taking his business seriously. He's in growth. Yeah. He's not some 60-year-old bloke that's just looking at retiring, doesn't want to talk to you and wants to go and play golf all day. Probably with some young guy, he's hungry, he wants to build a name. He's going to go over and beyond for your, you know, a couple of hundred bucks because he's, you know, he's going to look and say investment properties, businesses coming, that's going to be 10 coming into the future. So Google, you know, Google, search for anything. Same with a mortgage broker. You know, people that are bidding for keywords on Google, seriously, because as you know, as a business owner, it's bloody expensive. Yeah, yeah, that it is. Um, although, come on, mate, we've got unlimited money. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we're obviously in a very weird situation. At the end of last year, even early this year, no one could predict what we were about to go through. How does COVID change our attitude towards property? And is it going to be a long-term change or is the high quality asset that you're talking about still going to be in the same areas? COVID has brought to the forefront earning risk. So most people didn't think that their tenant could just go from paying rent last month to zero. In delinquencies, most of the time if a tenant went bad, you'd see it coming a mispayment here or there, but systemic defaults across the board, something new. So uh, landlord insurers, for example, had to stop offering landlord insurance overnight because they were like, fuck, you know, everyone defaulting on um, commercial real estate owners, all their tenants just paying, you know, a billion dollars a square meter to mm. no rent. So that earnings risk is very, very important. But what what's countered that, and this is, this is, again, part of the conversation around an investment. Don't just look at one side because an, an investment is always two parts, right? I'm changing cash for real estate. I'm changing cash for Tesla shares. So it's an exchange of two things. On the cash side, interest rates have slumped. Are we going to start buying um, debt from banks next year? Uh, this will come out and pump $200 billion in the economy. 
um, moratoriums on things. So the response has been massive too. And so as an investor, you have to say, okay, you know, tenants have defaulted and there's a bit of risk here. But if I'm doing nothing, my 50 grand and a and deposit at CBA or whatever it is, that's fundamentally changed more now because mm. the printing notes I'm getting zero on my on my money and there's just something bigger happening here. So that's the way I think about it. Mm. It, it is interesting. I think that um, uh, I, I I do wonder how this is going to be different. We'll, we'll we'll know for sure in terms of you know I know that there's a lot of people moving out to like Mornington here in Victoria because they realise you know what. This is this is going to be permanent. Work from home is going to be a thing. But I guess the interesting thing is that, you know, you mentioned commercial property. There's got to be an argument made soon enough, not today and probably not in the next couple of months, but there's got to be a situation whereby commercial property is going to become attractive, mm. right? At some point in time, businesses are going to come back. Hospitality is going to become a thing. Like, you know, all these things are going to occur. Like, it's getting... It's, they're obviously the prices are getting bent down. I mean, what, what's your view on, on commercial property generally? Have you always sort of stuck to residential or have you seen yeah. good opportunities? Uh, I bought some commercial myself, but commercials hard because real estate is really about debt. Um, so the more you can leverage, the more. Resi is beautiful because you can go borrow 90%, 90 against bricks and mortar with a secured income stream and I know what my interest rate is and I know what my terms are. Commercial is different because you need bigger deposits. Debt is shorter term. So mm. instead of going and borrowing 30 years, it's maybe a 10-year rolling term. Um, and it's it, the barriers to entry are higher. So it's a different kettle of fish. And then right? so, you know, your shop top, Surrey Hills or... Um, or, you know, Turak or wherever it is uh, where you've got your shop and your residence. That's very different to going and, and owning B or C grade um, office where your tenants are all on the edge uh, or going and owning a tower in the city. So commercial means different things to different people. Uh, right before this pandemic, there was a flood of international money coming from places like Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, where they're buying Aussie assets that give them 3% yields because at home they're getting 1%, right? Mm. And issues around their currency and stuff. So there's always buyers. Um, I think no one really knows. Um, I think what I do know is those with the biggest balance sheets also have access to a lot of resources, so they'll figure things out. Um, you know, if you have a look at schools, for example, schools are probably likely to go vertical into the future um, to utilize space. Um, there's a lot of industries. The medical industry um, is growing. Health is going to become big. Governments are likely to pick up slack in the middle. Uh, banks have figured out, financial services have figured out the consequence of offshoring your, mm. your engine, right? So when you've got call center in India and you know, you're a loan processing business and, you know, your loans are being processed and you can't process any loans, guess what? It was cheaper, but if you're not writing any loans, your whole value chain's being disrupted. So mm. I think things will change. You, you, you know, you've got a shop and a, and a tenant upstairs isn't going to feel the pain as the other guy, but probably isn't going to reap the reward either. Yeah, I, I definitely. I think it's going to be an interesting thing. Can you tell me? I mean, just before we do run out of time, there's there, there's a couple of questions as well that I want to get to. But yeah. just quickly, to to tell me how wealthy is. I mean, we we did speak a little bit out about this, but obviously, you know, I, I don't think I've ever heard outside of people who are uh, directly uh, benefiting from the sale of properties, real yeah. estate agents. I've never heard anyone as passionate, but also as knowledgeable as you. So, when it comes to property, how are you? How is wealthy changing the landscape, and and where where does it look like in the next two three years for you? I think what we're seeing is a new breed of millennials that want to have the lifestyle, uh, but they don't want to live like their parents, where their parents came, mig migrated here, or were born here, and bought a house out wherever they can afford, and slogged thirty years and paid off their mortgage and are now sort of, you know, baby boomers having done all the hard work but haven't enjoyed the experiences. Our generation, the new generation is, I want to live, I want to travel, I want to mm. have a nice car, I'm not going to slog away. Um, but I also understand I need to invest. Because I don't invest in 
know, those barbecues with my friends are become more awkward. I feel left behind. So rent vesting where you buy an investment wherever and you rent um, where you like is becoming a really popular strategy. You know, going rent in Bondi or Surrey Hills or Paddington, live close to work, hang out, party, but have an apartment in Penrith, you know, that, that the person that wants to live in Penrith can rent it out, pay my mortgage, and that way I'm in the market, but I get to pick. That's that's a massive, massive thing. And it's not just here. In the UK, if you look at London, for example, huge affordability issues. A whole generation cannot afford to buy London because the land is all, you know, the 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 um, what is it? the Earl of something owns, you know, blocks and blocks of property in central London, and you know, the aristocracy owns so much land and New York. LA. They're going all the, all the land over there, isn't it? I mean, technically, you're leasing from the Queen, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're leasing from, like, different people. And it's a big thing where, where this generation, a lot of these guys have gone into stocks, you know, yeah. they've gone into trading stocks. And that's fantastic. You know, they're putting their money to use. Um, but the generation that also doesn't understand stocks, they, they've lost money on stocks and want to buy real estate or whatever it is, um, that they're, they're starting to rent fest. That's a game changer. Mm. I think it's interesting. And for someone who does come in into your application, what are, what are some of the things that they immediately get as part of that wealthy experience, aside from hopefully a free house to you know? <laughs> We're working on the free house thing. I just going to find someone to fund it. They get a plan within 60 seconds. Um, we sit and see where they are, and then we match them against property that we've pre-screened. So if you don't want to do a domain, it's just whoever Anyone can list there and you don't know, you know, you don't know the property from a bar of soap and you have to call, answer, drive out, inspect, contract. There's no one sort of. So what we do is we say, hey, tell us a little bit about it. Based on what you've told us, this is what we've pre-screened. It's not for everybody, but we try to have really, really good coverage. We don't go in places that we don't like. And we just try to stick to places that we like. We have from $400,000 um, price point all the way up to a million and a half. Yeah, awesome. So for anyone that does want to get access, type in yes, uh, we can we can pass on those details. Alternatively, wealthy with an I dot com dot au um, uh, is, is where you can sign up and uh, it sounds pretty awesome. Uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, by the way, for anyone who did experience um, sort of signal issues, uh, Peter does have terrible connect internet connection. It's not my fault, clearly. A um, couple of questions for you. What are your thoughts on building up a share portfolio and buying property outright uh, to avoid bank loans? It's a that you can use, but it's not very tax effective for you. Yeah. Um, and if you're fine with that, then go for it. If you've got the, the balance sheet to make that happen, then absolutely. Um, where interest rates have never been this low before ever. Uh, you have your bond yields, you know, barely above 1% and fluctuating, you know, in the, in, in the mid, um, mid double digits. Um, you've got an environment where the, the government and the RBA are incentivizing banks to write risk. And mm -hmm. so if you want to stay in, if you want to buy an asset without debt, then you've got to find a pretty good reason for that. Um, mm -hmm. And, Sure. Yeah, it is going to be. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Robert says we plan to buy, uh, but not in Victoria because of the high levels of land tax. I'm don't know if that was a question. Sorry, <laughs> I think it was more of a comment. Like uh, uh, we we plan to buy, but not in Victoria because of the high levels of land tax. The land tax. I was... Yeah, I mean the strategy there where. Land tax is one of those things where state government, for all the nice things that they give you, uh, they need to, you know, recoup re recoup some of that back. Um, if you're a, if if you're an investor, you know, just know that apartments, for example, have less land component, and so when the state mm -hmm. government looks at calculating your land tax, um, apartments are going to probably be a bit more tax effective than big blocks of land. Mm. I think generally um, uh, I hear everything with the word not Victoria. Lately, LinkedIn people are like, I'm going to start up a new business and it's not going to be in Victoria. But anyway. Yeah. In the most livable city in the world, uh, in the mid-1800s, in the 19th century, Victoria was the most, um, it was 
the, uh, the rich, one of the richest cities in the world. Um, it's growing faster. It's going to have a population greater than Sydney within the next 10 years. And when there's blood on the streets, that's when you want to buy, right? That's when you get the deal, not when it's all rosy and hunky-dory. All right, Warren Buffett, come on. <laughs> uh, what's the budget for a mortgage broker, accountant, lawyer, if I want to buy a $700,000 house? Uh, well, the, what's the budget? Does that mean how much money do I need? Uh, I think well, how much how much should you plan for, I mean, a mortgage broker effectively is is free to the user, right? Typically, uh, an accountant oh, yeah. lawyer. How much are they going to cost? Oh, and like, how much are they budgeting? Yeah, uh, their investments. So yeah. what I would say is an accountant that charges two grand when when everyone else charges two hundred bucks. That two thousand dollars is not an expense; it's an investment because that guy is going to be there when, when, when the things go wrong. So mortgage brokers are, are remunerated by banks, which is a problem because you've got a lot of people that go into the mortgage broking industry that aren't good. So a good mortgage broker is someone that's been in the industry for a long time, someone that's dealt with problems, because they know what happens on the other side. They're not just a loan salesman. Um, and you find a box for referrals. So ask, 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 and eventually you get to the right one. Google, lawyer, Google also. Um, you do the Google test, who's advertising on Google AdWords. A lawyer for a property purchase is a couple of grand. Um, mm. And if someone's too cheap, you probably don't want to go with them because when you have a property transaction that's in a deadlock, that's when a good lawyer will come through and say, just leave it mm. sort of out for you. And I had an interesting situation with a lawyer where I went with someone cheap when I was buying uh, my apartment back in Sydney and Kiribilli um, and uh, they were meant to read through the Strata report, ended up getting a 25% bill of the purchase price of the property three months after I bought it uh, and that all ended up resulting in legal action. Luckily, thank, thank God for lawyer, for lawyer uh, insurance, but that could have become a very expensive decision um, if if you know, if, if I didn't do what I did. Um, but, yeah, definitely, you know, lawyer, accountant uh, and mortgage broker are all investments. Finding the hard ones. You need, like, a list of these guys in your platform if you, if you do. <laughs> um, last question for you before we go. We did run over time. I apologise for everyone uh, that, that did sit to 30 minutes. Probably you most, mostly do. We've all got things to do. But uh, do you agree with the first home loan deposit scheme, 5% deposit for the first home? Yes, because those schemes are designed for owner-occupiers, not for investors, and a lot of owner-occupiers need to, to get that. The government uh, guarantees and then a bank is going and lending, and when a bank's lending, they're doing their checks and balances, so they're not going to lend to anybody, right? They're going to lend to someone that's got a good job, can service, and so if, if I want to get into the market and I want to build a home and I want to move into it and I can service, then why that shouldn't be a bad thing, right? Mm. And what that does is it frees up the market for, for other opportunities. So I believe government incentives are great when they're targeted to the right people, not when they disadvantage one community group over another. And you, and you do have to be responsible and, and obviously stress test what happens if rates go up. Final, final question, and I have to do it because uh, actually my wife asked this. Uh, thank you for watching. I bought a place during the high peak. Am I ever going to get my money back? It is in a Sydney. Uh, it is just brown Surrey Hills, um, uh, and uh, I think it's off, I don't know, a little bit. Um, yeah, you will. Yeah, because if you bought around good infrastructure, they're not making more of that. They're not making more of what you bought. Populations want to grow. Interest rates are falling. So that's why a good investment time time, time come and, and solve that. As long as you've got a good time horizon, it's like buying a stock. If you buy Woolies during the GFC or if you CA, if you bought that good thing, eventually it's going to come back and it's a set and forget. And if you're earning income from it and you've got it rented out, then happy days. Okay, well, let's just hope that continues. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I think that uh, we definitely need to do a follow-up uh, in the not-too-distant future. I think there's a bit about mortgage brokers and accountants and lawyers that I'm sure you'll have a list. Uh, and obviously, we're, all, we're waiting for your free property offer uh, that I just... <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Sounds good. So if you want access to Wealthy, you can jump online and get access. I think it's self sign up, right? Um, you can you can yeah. you can sign up through that. Otherwise, just type in yes, we'll pass on the details. We did run a quick poll uh, on the right hand side. Um, uh, interestingly enough, property plans over the next six months. Fifty percent of the people that joined the call are looking to buy in the next six months. Ten uh, percent probably will buy, and forty uh, percent are just curious, which means they'll buy in the next twelve months, uh, or at least once they jump into the app. Um, again, thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, we hope to uh, catch you soon, uh, you. and uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully um, uh, all be uh, a much richer property investors by that stage. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for curating a great conversation, and um, again, congrats on all you guys are doing at Open Markets. Uh, keep going, and I'm sure there's going to be more interesting news around the corner. And um, we're, we're approachable guys, so if anybody wants to reach out and ask me questions anytime, um, you, you won't have a problem finding my ugly face on on uh, social media. Yeah, or all over TV. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ivan. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, bye.